Um, yes, my name is uh, Marina. I work here at Kingston University in the Department of Linguistics and Languages. So I'm very interested in language. My research, teaching, publication interests are in narratives and stories, which is pretty handy. Um, today we've heard some amazing and inspirational stories. I'm interested in stories because I'm interested in the way that people construct their experiences, the way that people form their experiences into a narrative structure with a coherent beginning, middle, and end. I'm interested in the way that we create a sense of self through stories. And I'm interested particularly in trauma narratives. And I will be talking about 9-11 and 7-7 a little bit later. Trauma narratives, um, I mean, these are extraordinary events. So you can imagine people who go through these uh, events, how they try to make sense of what's happened. So it's generally accepted that sharing stories is a universal activity. And as I said, it helps us to encode things like moral and ethical dilemmas. It gives us a sense of ourself in the world around us. Storytelling pervades every area of our lives. And the cognitive psychologist, Ed, um, Bruner, Jerome Bruner, uh, actually talks about us having a, a capacity, a propensity to form stories. He talks about it as being a push. In, in some, we have this kind of innate ability to do this. So let's have a look at some of the ways, some of the platforms, the, the mediums that, that we find stories. So we have the traditional face-to-face -face storytelling. But then, of course, we have the literary form of storytelling. And down there with the fairy tales, that perhaps presents or represents the most prototypical form of storytelling, the once upon a time leading to a happy ending. Of course, we have storytelling in art, and you'll recognize Picasso's Guernica. What about drama? And drama that's adapted for the stage. Music, opera, ballet, song. And of course, we also have media narratives, the narratives that we see in uh, print news, the narratives that we even see in advertising. And who can forget the London riots? Who can forget how we felt at the time? I think we all have our own stories. And of course, some of those stories I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, this series of slides, that traditionally we had the face-to-face -face storytelling, but of course we have social media. And what's really interesting is to think about how small something can be to be called a narrative. <coughs> so what makes a good story? Okay, I'll keep using this term narrative. I am gonna use the term narrative and story interchangeably. Narrative theorists will say that a minimal narrative consists of two events side by side, a sequence. Something happened, and then something else happened. That's a bit dull. It's not very interesting. We want to be able to evaluate these stories. Usually this link, this transformation, is causal. Okay. The um, literary critic and philosopher narratologist Svetan Todorov offered a model of narrative. It's quite an interesting one. And it's in five stages. So you begin at the beginning with a state of normality. Everything's, you've got a state of equilibrium. But then there's a disruption to this state of equilibrium, and that causes disequilibrium. There's a recognition to this disruption and then an attempt to repair the disruption. But what happens is that you, yes, there is a rest, uh, restoration of equilibrium, 
So you get a new state of normal. However, it's not quite the same as it was before. Things have changed forever. But you can see that there is a transformation process. What makes stories compelling is the fact that there is some kind of high point, a crisis, chaos. That is central <coughs> to a good story. I'm going to give you some examples on the power of stories. I'm going to look at global, collective, and personal narratives. July the 7th, 2005, London's 7-7 terrorist bombings. I'm a Londoner, and for me, this was a, a huge event. I want to tell you about Martine Wright. You may know the name. So, London 7-7, series of coordinated bomb attacks on three underground stations, out, just outside Liverpool Street Station, Edgware Road, Russell Square. There was also a double-decker uh, bus that exploded in Tavistock Square uh, in central London. 52 people were killed, the four bombers, and many hundreds of people injured. One person who was traveling on the Circle Line that morning was Martine Wright. And when I interviewed Martine, she told me she wasn't meant to be on the train that morning. She woke up late. She was partying the night before. She woke up late. And her whole day, her whole life changed as a result. Martine, unfortunately, was in the same carriage as the bomber and uh, sustained horrific um, injuries. She lost both her legs. But what is truly remarkable is that she didn't give up. She trained to be an athlete. And in 2012, she was selected to represent Great Britain in the uh, women's sitting volleyball um, uh, game, sport. Um, and in 2016, she was appointed a member of the British Empire for her services to sport. I mean, it's truly remarkable if we're talking about empowerment and overcoming, which is the theme of today's talks. I interviewed Martine because I was looking at trauma narratives and the way we try to make sense of these extraordinary um, events. And she told me, I, I do think that I'm unlucky, uh, that I do think that I'm lucky, I'm unlucky that I walked onto the train that morning, but so, so lucky to have survived. I'm doing things now that I never, ever dreamt possible. You can imagine talking to somebody so inspiring. But let me also tell you another story. I extended my research on trauma narratives and, and London 7-7 bombings, and I went to New York. I went to Manhattan. I wanted to extend my research because I, I found some interesting, um, I had some insights, and I thought, is that what some people do? Is that what everybody does? I know. I'll speak to some other people. I went to New York. Now, most of the people I've interviewed have been able to tell me their stories. Sometimes people are not around to tell their story, and somebody else has to tell it for them. <clears throat> Let me tell you about Todd Ouida. Or actually, let me tell you what Herb, his father, told me about his son, Todd. When I asked him to tell me what happened on that day, it was important for Herb to go back to when Todd was a child. Todd suffered childhood anxiety, and as a result, couldn't go to school. He was very anxious. Um, with the love and support of his parents, his family, and with medical help, he was able to overcome this problem. He was able to finish his studies, 
go on to university, the University of Michigan, and he got a fantastic job in financial services with Cantor Fitzgerald in the World, World Trade Center. Herb also worked in the World Tra Trade Center, so they both worked in the North Tower. And he told me that every day they would get the ferry across to Manhattan, they would have lunch together. When Flight 11 struck the North Tower, it struck the floors, the impact zone was floors 93 to 101. Herb, the father, was on the 77th floor and he managed to escape. And he told me that he waited at the bottom, he waited for his son. His son was 25. He's fit, he's young. Todd was on the 105th floor. He was trapped, and he didn't survive. Todd, um, Herb then told me why he wanted to tell me Herb's story. Um, sorry, Herb told me why he wanted to tell Todd's story. And I never know, and I never know how I'm going to be when I tell the story, but it doesn't matter. I have to tell the story. Telling the story is therapeutic, it's important. There was a Todd Breeder. He walked this earth. That final line for me said everything. And in fact, when I put a request out for people's stories on the 9-11 list, I was overwhelmed with the amount of people who wanted to be interviewed, to tell me their story. That's why. Herb and his wife Andrea set up a children's uh, foundation to help other <coughs> children with childhood anxiety. My buddy Todd. And to date have raised over a million and a half dollars, which is extraordinary. I feel so honored to have met these people and to have them share their story with me. And I've been able to share their story. I'm also an accredited life coach as well as an academic. And storytelling is very much central to that process. However, instead of going back to the past, life coaching is about wanting to change your future story. So when clients come to see me, it's because they want to make a change. And it's about transforming their lives. One of the ways you can do this is to narrativize your experiences, where you are now and to set goals, and to try and move on, to try and achieve those goals. So, telling stories, it's a really powerful activity. We do it to get a sense of ourselves, to position ourselves in the world, to be able to share our experiences because of what they encode. So we are constantly revising our life stories as part of this process. It's all a process. And today we've heard some incredible stories. And as I look out here, look at you, looking at me, telling my story, because I'm telling you about my research, and I'm in my research I'm telling you other people's stories, I wonder, what's your story?